If there was no free will, there'd be no point of Jannat and Jahannam. The grand scheme of things, the way they are, is because, is, uh, and part of that is that Allah gave us free will to make our decision because Allah says, وَمَا هُوَ وَمَا أَنَا بِظَلَّامٍ لِلْعَبِيدٍ I am not one to oppress even in the least my servants. I will not oppress at all. لا يظلم شيئا. Allah does not oppress even the slightest. Allah will only punish us for wrongs that we have committed. Nobody will go into hellfire thinking that they have been oppressed or wronged or put in without justice. They will realize the wrongs that they have done because Allah only is just and nothing else. Allah is just. There's no you know, unfair doesn't apply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallama tasliman kathiran ila yawmi al-deen amma ba'd. Qala Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala fi al-Qur'an al-Majid wa al-Furqan al-Hamid wa quli al-Haqq min Rabbikum. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ وقال تعالى في سورة الإنسان إن هذه تذكرة فمن شاء اتخذ إلى ربه سبيلا وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كما رواه مسلم المؤمن القوي خير وأحب إلى الله من الضعيف وفي كل خير احرص على ما ينفعك ولا تعجز وإن أصابك شيء فلا تقل لو أني فعلت كذا كان كذا ولكن قل قدر الله وما شاء فعل فإن لو تفتح عمل الشيطان My dear respected friends السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The topic I want to deal with today I think it's an overdue topic and the reason for it is that our entire life revolves around this belief. And if we have a mistaken belief in this regard, it actually will spoil a person's life. People who commit suicide have a problem with this point, with this subject, with this issue. Anybody who commits suicide out of desperation, despondence, hopelessness, depression, this is the, this is the antidote for this. this all of those things are a symptom that a person hasn't understood this particular issue. What I'm going to speak about is not stories. What I'm going to speak about are not accounts. There may be a few accounts here and there. But the main thing that I'm going to speak about is a concept to understand. For that you'll have to be awake on this New Year's Eve. It's not going to be fireworks. But it's going to require some interaction. It's going to, it's going to require your understanding because it's not just a, uh, a story that I'm going to tell you. It's going to require to really understand and reflect over what our understanding of this particular subject, subject is. The subject that I speak about, I mean, you've seen the, the poster. It says Qadr and destiny, predestination. Now, right from the outset, predestination is one of those topics that people kind of mention um, half-heartedly or without full knowledge about. Uh, some people will mention it that it's something that we can't deal with, we can't go into de depths about, which is true. It's not allowed to. For example, there's a hadith in which uh, Imam Tirmidhi uh, relates this hadith from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came out from his room, we were sitting in the masjid, so if this is the masjid, the Prophet's room was there. And w one day the Prophet suddenly appeared. And we were there discussing in this heated manner. We were discussing Qadr, destiny. When he came in and he saw this, He was so angry. He was so angry that it is as if a pomegranate seed had been crushed on his cheeks. You know, that's, that's the resemblance that's being mentioned here. And the Prophet ﷺ said, أَفَبِهَاذَا أُمِرْتُمْ 
Is this what you've been commanded to do? This is what you've been ordered to do? To discuss these things at this level, in this kind of fashion? Am bihada ursiltu ilaykum? Is this what I've been sent to you for? To discuss these kind of issues? Innama halaka man kana qablakum Heena tanaza'u fil amr Fi hadha al-amr The people before you were destroyed Their lives were spoilt They were punished You know, you could understand this in many ways When they began to discuss and engross themselves In this issue Azamtu alaykum Azamtu alaykum an la tanaza'u fi I insist upon you I insist that you do not you do not debate this issue now because of this hadith because it's sirrum min asrarillah it's definitely one of the secrets of Allah uh, as the ulama have discussed that it is something which if you try to go into depths and try to reconcile every aspect of it then you will come out either as a fatalist or an absolute proponent of absolute free will and both of those are extremes it is the secret of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when certain scholars for example Malik ibn Anas radiallahu anhu rahimahullah re reports that uh, there's a famous scholar of his time whose name was Iyas ibn Mu'awiyah he says uh, somebody asked Iyas ibn Mu'awiyah uh, ma ra'yuka fil qadr what's your opinion about predestination like, what a question so Iyas ibn Mu'awiyah said ra'yi ibnati my opinion is my daughter like an absurd answer to an absurd question. I'd rather be concerned about my daughter than Qadr because it's not something I can deal with. And then what he meant by that is Nobody knows its secret except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now, what are we going to discuss today then? Well, we need to discuss it because there is a certain amount of knowledge that Allah has provided us about it through the narrations. Numerous narrations, there's whole chapters in the books of Hadith, Kitab al-Qadr. It's there in part of Kitab al-Iman, the chapter on Qadr. And the Prophet ﷺ discusses many different aspects about this. And the reason why this is so important is because much of the, uh, pre uh, the depression today is because of a misunderstanding and an ignorance about this. First and foremost, the reason why there is predestination or the fact that there is predestination is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about everything that is going to happen what is predestination predestination destiny predestination essentially is the grand plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from pre-eternity from the endless furthest reaches of pre-eternity about what he wants to do in this world so basically, today's program where we're all sitting here today was an absolute knowledge of Allah before it occurred. Before even you and I were born, before our grandparents were born. It was as if Allah had seen this already. So the fact that it's taking place today doesn't make any difference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's almost, it's, it is, not it is almost, it is as if it's already done. It's a done deal. Because time doesn't apply to Allah. We move in time. We are like in a garden. We are like in a garden where we can do what we want within certain limitations within that garden. But we can't do anything beyond that garden. So this world, the amount of power, that limited power we have, that is how much we can function in. And beyond that we can't. And our time, if I ask you a question, what is time? How do you define time? Time is something we use all the time. But what is time? How do you define time? Time is defined today. Time is defined today by the clock. 24 hours or 12 times 2. I prefer the 12 times 2 than the 24 hours, personally. But 12 times 2 or 24 hour clock is a very recent phenomenon, about 40, 50 years old. Before that, the clocks used to work differently. Time essentially all it is, it's a relative, it's a relative, uh, it's a relative state to something happening. And because the starting of the day and the ending of the day, the beginning of night, are so evident phenomena around us, they are realities that we can't miss. We generally go by that. Otherwise, time can be measured by when people come back from Hajj. 
when the crops grow, when it's the shortest day of the year. But generally because the sun rises generally at a predictable rate, predictable time, we generally measure it based on that. And we've taken those times and kind of split it into number of hours, number of minutes, and so on and so forth, just to make it easy. That's essentially what time is. Time is just the relative distance to something in time. That's what it is. Essentially, it's like units. If you take a ruler, if you take a ruler and you see the, uh, the centimeters on there, and you see the, the lines for each centimeter block, unit. So essentially, time is just according to that. For any one of us, we suddenly appear in one of those units, we stay for a few units, and then we disappear and we've gone. Right? Likewise with everybody, they come into those units, there's the unit before that, they weren't there. They only started in this next unit, and they carry on, and then they end, and they go. Do you understand that? Yeah. If you understand it, everybody understands it. And that's the great thing about it. What's your name? Abdurrahman. There you go, that's why. Abdurrahman, mashallah. The best name according to Allah. Abdurrahman Abdullah, that's why. Right? Rahman Kabanda. Servant of the Rahman, that's what you are. Right? That's what we all are. Anyway, when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't fit into these, these units because there's not enough units. There's not enough units to encompass Him. He's before any of these units. Do you understand? Very difficult for us to really understand because everything that surrounds us comes into being and perishes. It, it starts to exist and then it ends its existence. That's what we're so used to that. That it's very difficult for us to understand the concept of infinite, uh, infinite uh, pre-eternality and post-eternality. But anyway, let's get to something else now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hence knew everything. There's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It says that 50,000 years before the creation of the world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the pen, the qalam. And he created the divine tablet, Allah al-Mahfuz. And he said to the pen, write, uktub, madha uktub, what should I write, ya, ya, ya Allah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, write everything that is going to occur until the day of judgment. Now, where did that pen get the knowledge from to write everything until the day of judgment? Obviously, from the knowledge of Allah, which encompasses everything to happen until the day of judgment and beyond that because beyond that is eternity jannat and jahannam are forever nothing can encompass that only the knowledge of allah because he is eternal but we're going into realms that are very difficult for us to understand so let's get back to the point that 50000 years before the creation of this world allah wrote everything down that was to occur now the question that arises is that everything that is written in the divine tablet is occurring in the world because Allah knew what was going to happen. So then, doesn't it mean that we should not be responsible for the good or the evil that we do? Because we're just going according to plan. Right? Everything just seems to be going according to what's written. So why should we then be rewarded for any good that we do or punish for anything evil that we do. Well, let's introduce a new concept here of free will. Now, first and foremost, you know what free will is? Free will is the ability in us to do what we want when we want to a certain degree. For example, everybody that's sitting here today, you came here by your own will. You weren't literally dragged into here with while you're protesting, unless your friends did drag you in here, or unless your father did drag you in here, right? But still, you had the ability to resist. You came in here with a will. There may have been encouragement, but you came here with your free will. Now, we understand free will. Free will is established through two different ways. Number one, it's established by our experience. We feel free will. None of us feels forced. Food is sitting there. We don't feel forced to eat it. We can't help our hands getting down there and, you know, taking the food in. We make that choice to do it. Right. So we feel that we experience it. When you shake your hands voluntarily, a normal person gets his hand and shakes it voluntarily. That is free will. You also have people in this world who, are, uh, who have Parkinson's disease, for example. They can't help shaking their hands. 
Even if they want to stop, they can't. Their hand shakes involuntarily. So there's a clear difference between an involuntary shaking of the hand and a voluntary shaking of the hand. Another thing is that when you're walking on level ground, you are just walking. You can, uh, to a certain degree, control your pace. Try walk, walking down an incline or a hill and suddenly you have less control over your pace. Yes, you can stop, but if you're walking, you are still being helped because of gravity, as we call it. So clearly we understand that that is where you have free will, but you see that there's some other influence there as well. Right. However, free will is established and it's only because the human has free will that there is Jannat and Jahannam. If there was no free will, there'd be no point of Jannat and Jahannam. The grand scheme of things, the way they are, is because, is, uh, and part of that is that Allah gave us free will to make our decision because Allah says, وَمَا هُوَ وَمَا أَنَا I am not one to oppress even in the least my servants. I will not oppress at all. لا يظلم شيئا. Allah does not oppress even the slightest. Allah will only punish us for wrongs that we have committed. Nobody will go into hellfire thinking that they have been oppressed or wronged or put in without justice. They will realize the wrongs that they have done because Allah only is just and nothing else. Allah is just, there's no you know, unfair, doesn't apply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So because of the fact that we have free will, there is paradise and there's hell. Or there's hell and paradise and because of that we have free will. You can see it either way, it's the grand scheme of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now once we've established free will, then how is it possible that we exercise our free will, our volition, our choice, right? We're independent and autonomous in doing so, but then it's all written, it's already written. So how have we got free will when it's already written? Whatever we're doing is in accordance to what's written, and what's written is in accordance to what we're doing. So how do you understand that then? If you've got your free will and you experience free, nobody is. Does anybody deny free will here? Right? I don't think there's anybody. I mean, there were groups who denied it theoretically. Practically, you can't because you know you feel free will. Then how is it possible that you're going according to what's written in the divine tablet in Allah al Mahfuz? Once I was, I, I would say, in a half guilty sense, I was uh, racing down the the motor the highway in California, the freeway. Uh, 101 on the coast and I was stopped by I was only going about 80 miles an hour by the way right which in England is nothing generally people 80 is kind of like tolerable people go 90 and 100 but in America that was a big deal because 65 is the limit in California in most places so 80 was a bit now for some reason I was coming back and this police stopped me and uh, I said a few things to him. I said, you know, please, this, that, and the other. He says, but it's your free, it's your, it's, it's your destiny. So I said, oh, okay, what's, what's destiny? So we had a little chat and I explained uh, this understanding that I'm about to give you about destiny uh, as to how it goes in accordance with what's written, how it is destiny. He still gave me a ticket. He appreciated what I mentioned, but he still ended up giving me a ticket because that was the destiny, right? That was my destiny at the, on the day. Now what happens is, going back to that question, how do we reconcile the fact that everything has been written, but we still have free will, and we don't feel forced? The reason is simple. Whatever Allah had written in that divine tablet, if you understand this, it will make a lot of things simple for you. Then inshallah, you will not feel doomed. You will not feel depressed. You will not feel as if you know your future, because nobody does. Nobody does. Whatever is written in there is written based on the knowledge of what Allah knew, right? The knowledge of Allah of what we were going to do with our free will. So, for example, what's your name, brother? Allah knew that brother Uthman, when he comes into the, I'm going to call you Uthman, okay, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, when he comes into this world, he's going to be doing this, 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 this with his free will. He's going to come to Masjid Abu Bakr on this New, Year, New, Year, New Year's Eve <coughs> with his free will. And that's what Allah wrote. He will do this with his free will. He will do this. You know, it was a descriptive detail, not prescriptive. Not that Uthman has to do this. Yusuf has to do this. And Abdurrahman Bai has to do this. He didn't write that. That's not what it was written. If it was written in that fashion, Zaid has, Imam Abu Hanifa clarifies this clearly. If it was written like that, then that means we would be 
compulse, uh, co uh, compelled. We don't have any free will. But we experience the free will and that's what's written there. Only because Allah knew what we were going to do. I'll give you another example. If you're a teacher, you've taught somebody for a year or two, you under, you're kind of understood their capability. Come time for exam, what you did was before the exams, you wrote down what you predicted. You predicted some grades of this. Then after that, they go take their exams, their tests. After the test, you get the results. And you compare your results. Sorry, you compare the actual results with your predictions. You'll see that most of it is very similar. You can still make mistakes because we're human beings. We don't really know the future. We think we can speculate about our future. So they will be very similar. We may have missed out in something, right? This guy was a straight A student, but for some reason on that day, he messed up. But most of the others were the same, right? With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's never a mess up. It's absolute knowledge, 100%. There's never a mistake or an error at all. So whenever well, he knows, it's because for him, time doesn't apply to him. It's like the whole universe is less than... You know, imagine you have one of those medicinal, me medical capsules, uh, medi you know, medicine. Imagine an entire, an entire universe taking place in there of bacteria. You can get thousands of bacteria on a pinhead. So imagine that scope. Now, again, Allah is even beyond that. But just to understand, an entire universe is taking place in there. I mean, what difference does it make? And that's not even a proper example. Allah is beyond that. But we must understand that what's written is not prescriptive, it's descriptive. Allah wrote what we were going to do with our free will because He knew what we were going to do with our free will. We end up doing exactly according to what's in the divine tablet because Allah knew what we were going to do with our free will. So now, do you feel more free now? Do you feel less compelled? Alhamdulillah. Now, let's understand a few things. What is the whole point of destiny then? Destiny then in that sense is our belief that Allah has planned and knows and is in control of everything before it occurs. That's the belief we have. What benefit does this belief give us then? What benefit does this belief give us? It gives us the benefit because destiny, qadr, predestination has not been established or instituted to destroy people's ambitions and goals. How so? Only if you have a misunderstanding of it. How can it be? It is not to destroy our ambitions, our goals and our desires. Right? Rather, it is to allow bygones to be bygones. It is to help us not cry over spilt milk. It is to help us get back on our feet after that stumble or fall and carry on and keep trying. Why do I say that? The reason I say that is because a few things. Number one, if the misunderstanding people have is that if certain things start going wrong in their life, they've had a series of events which have gone wrong in their life. They had an accident, they, were supposed, they made a proposal and they lost that proposal. They didn't get the job they were looking for. Three setbacks. And suddenly you start thinking that your world has ended. Aren't you still getting your food? Aren't you still surviving? Aren't you still breathing? Aren't you still living in this world, making salat, worshipping Allah? Just because some things are affecting us monetarily or in terms of position or, some, or it's not going according to how we want it, we suddenly feel like God hates us. We suddenly feel like it's the end of the world. It suddenly feel like I'm finished there's other people they have had a setback something bad has happened in their life or they've just led a life of 10 years of sin and now they feel that there is no way for them to repent and to turn around and to become better and that's a big fallacy who told you how do you know what's written for you oh i am doomed i am finished i am a sinner I'm going to hell anyway. So let me just do this as well. That's what people say. What difference is it going to make? I'm going to hell anyway. That's what people say. Na'udhu Billah. How do you know? Who told you so? Which angel told you so? Not even and this divine tablet, right? Which is probably 
the closest that we could probably get to the knowledge of the unseen because beyond that is the knowledge of Allah which is even more uh, a greater repository of the unseen. The divine tablet it mentions in the books of Aqidah that not even the closest of the angels know what's going on in there. Not even the greatest of the angels are privy to what's going on in there. Now the Divine Tablet, when the Prophet ﷺ went on his ascension, Mi'raj, in one of the hadith it mentions that he came to a place where he could hear the Sarikh Aqlam al Malaika. He could hear the screeching of the pens of the angels. The Prophet ﷺ heard the screeching of the pens of the angels. So, what are they writing? Essentially, my understanding of this is this that you have the a divine tablet, Allah al Mahfuz. Now, in the Allah al Mahfuz, everything is described as to what's going to happen. So, what happens then is that angels are in charge of administrating the affairs of the world. That's why Fajr time and Asr time, you have a shift change of angels. Fajr time and Asr time, you have shift change of in the day angels and the night angels, they come and they shift at that time. A there are angels that bring about the punishment in the world, bring about the crops in the world, bring about the rain in the world, and the different things that occur around the world. So what happens is, it seems as if the next week, the next day or two, the next week, the next month of information pertaining to a certain issue is released to these angels, so then they do. So the whole uh, set of uh, uh, the, all the knowledge, all the ac uh, nobody has ac absolute access to everything that's in that uh, in the divine tablet, but they have access to however Allah subhanahu wa taala, as much as Allah wants, of the next month or two or year or whatever the case is, depending on who it is, to administrate that this is how Allah wants it to happen. Okay, but nobody knows everything in there. Now, the other thing is, as I mentioned, nobody knows. That if I'm going to die at the age of 70 or 80 or 90 or whatever it is, how I'm going to die. The reason the Prophet ﷺ explained these things very clearly. There's another hadith of Rasulullah ﷺ which says that a person acts like a person from hellfire. Which means he does sins. It seems like he's Jahannami all his life. Then there's only a hand span, very short distance left between him and Jahannam. And it just seems like... He's going directly, zooming straight for that direction. He's going to hit the wall anytime now. And suddenly it changes because Allah knows him to be good instead of evil. And thus he does a good turn at the end of his life, ends up in Jannat. It's literally like somebody's about to have an accident. He gets saved all of a sudden. And yet on the other hand, the Prophet also said some people all their life, do the deeds of the people of Jannat. So they do good deeds. They don't seem like they're ever going to enter hellfire. And right at the end, when it seems like they're just about to gain entry, they mess up. What a sad scene. Now, good all their life, mess up at the end. Bad all of their life, suddenly do one good deed. And they end up in Jannah. For example, time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was a man, there was a battle raging. The Prophet ﷺ is there. A man suddenly comes and he says, I want to take part in this battle. He was not a believer. He was not a Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said, fine, you can take part, but at least embrace the faith first. At least say, la ilaha illallah. Say the shahada. He said the shahada. He said the shahada, no salat, no fasting, no zakat, nothing. Entered the battle and was martyred. And the Prophet ﷺ said, amila qalilan ujira kathiran. So little did he do, but so great a reward did he acquire. So that's a last minute scene. Now just to put our hearts at rest, that we're doing, hopefully we're trying to do good all of our life. Then if we mess up at the last minute, as there are stories of that nature, well, the ulama have mentioned that from observation, from observation and through trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what we realize is that it's generally the people who are heading for that wall, the evil ones that become right, than the good ones turning wrong. That seldom happens. That seldom happens. It's a possibility that the good person also become bad, but it's generally the bad who become good. So because good begets more good, and evil begets more evil. So if you're going to do good, it can only inshallah become better. So it is a chance because 
everything is open to chance in this world. That it can happen. That's why we say, Rabbana la tuzik qulubana ba'da idh hadaytana wa hab lana min ladunka rahma innaka anta al-wahhab. Oh Allah, do not cause our hearts to deviate, become crooked after you've given us guidance. Very important dua of the Quran. So now, somebody then asked the Prophet ﷺ a question after he mentioned this scenario to them. فَفِيمَ الْعَمَلُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Bukhari, say Bukhari hadith. فَفِيمَ الْعَمَلُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ What is the point of doing deeds then? If it's all written and at the last minute it can take a swerve, then what is the point of deed? The Prophet ﷺ said, اِعْمَلُوا فَكُلُّ مُيَسَّرٌ لِمَا خُلِقَ لَهِ that no, you keep doing the deeds and trying and making your effort for the direction you want because every person will be facilitated in the direction that has been destined for him. Now, this tells us, there's a hadith I'm going to uh, read to you right now, Sahih Hadith of Muslim. This puts the whole situation into perspective. It tells us that predestination is not there to cause you to become hopeless and despondent. Right? Because nobody knows their end. Even if your whole life has been going bad for you, it doesn't mean that your end will be bad. And that's why the end part has the most significant. The hadith of Rasulullah says, Innamal a'malu bil khawatim. Actions are according to their ending states. Actions are according to the end state, the final state. How was that? That's what your action is going to be taken. That's the beauty of a believer's actions and intentions. That you could turn everything around. You could wash away all the sins. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, That the one who repents from sins is like the one who has no sins from before. Some scholars even say that that person may even be superior to a person who doesn't have any sins. In some cases. Because of the act of Tawbah that raised his status. In fact, I saw always wonder about this. But recently there's been a number of studies number of studies on the mind, how the mind is wired with all of these neurons, millions, billions of neurons. And according to this particular study, it shows that you are different when you are 40 years old to when you are 20 years old. Though you have the same carrier body that you have been given in this world to use, this body will be destroyed and decomposed in the grave or however we die. In the hereafter, we'll be given a new body from some basic elements of our body, but us, who we are, who are you as an individual? Who, what, what does it, how do you define an insan? According to this new study, it says that because of the way our mind is made up with all of these neurons and so on, and the changes that keep taking place, you are a different person when you're 30 than when you were 20. For me, that makes a lot of sense because the Prophet ﷺ said, the person who repents from sin is like the one who had no sin. So you could have had 30 years of crime, criminal nature, sin upon sin, worst person, and you then make tawbah, you go and perform a hajj, you go and sit in the right company, and you desist from that life. You're a different person now in your mind. That's why the Prophet ﷺ also said, if somebody has committed a sin and then repented, and then you go and start censoring them for that sin, taunting them for it, you will not die until Allah also engrosses you in that sin. Which is a very dangerous thing because we're supposed to give people benefit of the doubt. If Allah can forgive and if the Prophet ﷺ can say, the one who repents from sin is like the one who has no sin, then what right do you and I have to go and taunt somebody from a sin that he could have see, sought forgiveness from? That's very important to understand. That's a humbling fact. If Allah forgives, if the Prophet ﷺ is telling us not to taunt somebody, then who, what right do we have to do this? Now let me read this hadith of Sahih Muslim to you. The Prophet ﷺ said, المؤمن القوي خير وأحب إلى الله من الضعيف The stronger believer, the stronger believer is superior and more beloved to Allah than the weak one. Meaning physically stronger as well, right? Not just Iman stronger, but physically stronger. That person is more beloved to Allah because he can do more, right? And then the Prophet ﷺ said, وَفِي كُلٍ خَيْرٍ But both have goodness with them because they've got belief. Belief is so valuable. Preserve it. Very valuable. Both of them have goodness. Now the Prophet ﷺ tells us the most important thing. إِحْرِسْ عَلَى مَا يَنْفَعُكَ Avidly search 
for what benefits you. Look out, go after, make efforts behind what benefits you. What is he telling us here? If it, if it was that just sit back and let the taqdeer take place, and you're not part of the taqdeer, taqdeer is independent of you, it is independent, but we're all part of the system. And what we are required to do is to work hard. If we were not, and it was, we were supposed to be just puppets with no volition whatsoever, then the Prophet ﷺ would not have said, you should avidly look and seek what is beneficial for you. Do not ever give up. Do not become feeble. Do not sit back and be laid back and do nothing. You're supposed to actively try. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, look, وَإِنْ أَصَابَكَ شَيْءٌ فَلَا تَقُلْ لَوْ أَنِّي فَعَلْتُ كَذَا كَانَ كَذَا don't, if something does afflict you, if something doesn't go according to plan and it goes wrong, then don't start saying, oh, if I did it this way, then it, this would have happened. If I did this, then this would have happened. But say, Qaddar Allah. Allah destined this. This was Allah's plan. Whatever He wishes, He does. Ma sha'a fa'al. This is the destiny of Allah. This is the plan of Allah. Whatever He wants to do, He does. The Prophet ﷺ said, the reason why you shouldn't say, if this, if that, if this, if this, is because, فَإِنَّ لَوْ تَفْتَحْ عَمَلَ الشَّيْطَانِ If you keep saying, if, 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 it opens the door up for shaitan, and eventually you will start complaining against Allah, and you will become depressed. Now, let's understand this hadith. This hadith does not mean that you shouldn't learn from your mistakes. Of course, we must learn. If I made a mistake, and that caused the accident, then don't do that again. Right? If I go and start driving without a license, then that's a bit stupid, isn't it? I don't know how to drive. I grab my dad's car and go out. There's obviously, it's going to cause a problem. Right? So, I must learn from my mistakes. But if something wrong happens, you spill some milk, don't become depressed. It's not the end of the world. You don't know that... You, you see, whenever something wrong happens, it depresses us. It depresses us. For example, I'll give you an example. If you go out collecting for the masjid, for example, and the first guy gives you, no, I don't have any money. Well, I've already donated. And the next guy gives you two pounds. And the third guy gives you five pounds. And the next guy tells you, I don't have any money. Then you feel like, why don't I just take a thousand pounds from my own bank account? It's easier than going to 10, 15 people and they only give me 50 pounds at the end of it. Right? It's depressing. That's the way the world works. You have one setback and you feel depressed. You think the world becomes dark around you. And you start feeling like everything's become dark. Now, on the other hand, if you went to collect and the first guy gave you money, yes, bilkul, 500 pound check. 2,000 pound check and I'll give you another one next week. Yeah, let's go to another person. Let's go to another person. Good begets more good. It just makes you more enthusiastic. The point here is that we need to avoid feeling depressed and despondent and hopeless. Because the Prophet ﷺ is clearly saying, try your best to get what benefits you. Do not sit back and feel feeble. Wala ta'jiz. And do not keep saying, if this, if that, forget about it. You know the people who keep going on about the past? They suffer the most. The people who keep going on about the past, they suffer the most. That's why forgetfulness is a barakah of Allah. It's a blessing. People who cannot forget the evils of the past, bad experiences of the past, they should pray to Allah to make them forget. Because all they keep seeing in front of them is the evil of things. That's what they remember. And if it wasn't for forgetfulness, imagine how sad our lives would be. You know, have you ever felt the pain you feel when you lose something, when you lose someone? But that pain recedes. It becomes lighter as the days go by. If that pain stayed the same every time you lost, can you imagine the number of pains you'd be feeling? You lose your grandfather, grandmother, another grandfather, another grandmother, a friend, father. Imagine five griefs, all feeling the same way. We'd never be able to survive. Allah's plan is wonderful. But if anybody forcefully wants to remember the evil, we must remember it. No, get rid of it. Forget it. Look positively. That's how rewire your brain. It's a possibility even scientists are telling you. Now, let us look at this. Anybody who becomes so depressed because of something, or anybody who feels that I shouldn't do anything and I should just be laid back and everything will happen, both of these are extreme fatalists. These are wrong. This is not what Allah wants. Allah wants us to try. That's why, let me read from Surah Al-Hadid to you another verse which clarifies this. مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ 
ولا في أنفسكم إلا في كتاب من قبل أن نبرأها إن ذلك على الله يسير This is so wonderful He says Allah says Any musibah Any affliction Any calamity Which hits the earth Or which afflicts you directly Anywhere in the world Or you directly All of it Has been written in a book Before we even created you Exactly what I explained before All of that has been written In the ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرُ This is simple for Allah This is simple for Allah What is the point of this though? What is the benefit of all of this being written beforehand? Now look. لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا آتَاكُمْ وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ كُلَّ مُخْتَالٍ فَخُورٍ It's for two benefits. Number one, so that you do not feel, you do not feel sorrowful. You do not become depressed over what you do not get. If something misses you, you miss something, don't become depressed. Understand that this was written for me. There's a benefit in me not having this. That's the benefit to know that if Allah doesn't want us to have it, we're not going to have it. Now, before you don't have it, before you miss it, do you know that you're going to get it or not? If something may come to you next week, there's gonna be, they're, gonna, uh, they're going to uh, announce the winner next week. They're going to announce the position next week. You've applied. Now, do you know what that decision is? No, we don't. Right? We, the Prophet ﷺ is telling us, try. Okay, we tried. We didn't get it. Now you know you don't get it. Now you realize that that's what Allah wanted from you. But you can't say from beforehand, Oh, nobody ever gets that. I'm not going to get it as well. Try. Believe me, in my life, I've, and I'm sure all of us, have come upon many of these kind of roadblocks. Where there's a determination. There's a culture of certain people getting something. If you try, Allah will give it to you. If it's good for you, Allah will give it to you. Against all odds. Believe me, against all odds. I will relate to you a story. In Hajj, I had a doctor that slept next to me. He's a young surgeon. And he had an amazing story. An amazing story. He got A, Bs and Cs in his GCSEs. Not the most wonderful uh, GCSE not the most wonderful GCSE result. In his A-levels, I don't think he got many A's in I don't think he got any A's in there at all. Right? B's and C's. Now, somebody tells him, he's, he gets in, he finally takes up a, a, a course to do with uh, medical science, but not medicine, not dentistry, not optometry, something else, I forget exactly, but a lower, you know, where the rejects kind of go, in King's College, he gets in there for this kind of, you know, uh, this low-end course. Somebody tells him at the end, this uh, lecturer of his, tells him at the end, you should become a doctor. He says, where am I going to become a doctor? Who's going to accept me for a medic medicine position with the grades that I have and with the course that I'm doing? He says, no, you should try. Try internally first in King's College, right? Because the same college, they might accept you. He tried, rejected. He says, no, you should try the other universities around the country. He says, okay, fine. He was trying, you see. He didn't give up. Now, everything is against him. Is anything for him? Everything is against him. But there's somebody that Allah provided to give him a bit of him and aspiration. So what he does is, he writes to 25 universities around the country. 25 of them. No, sorry. He first applied to three universities. You know, through UCAS. He got rejected. Second rejection. Right? That's four rejections altogether. Now, he's still told, no, write to the universities around the country. He writes to the universities. How many of the 25 give him, an, give him an acceptance? Not a single one. Right? Now that's how many rejections? 25 plus 3 plus 1. That's 24 rejections. Right? Sorry, 29. Yes. 29 rejections. Now what? You can apply again to kings. He's allowed to apply twice. The guy said, apply again to kings. So he applied again. And I think this time he didn't hear anything. Yet. Now his exams are finished. His mum booked him a holiday through Teletext. This was in the 80s, early 90s. You know Teletext, right? His mum didn't know this place in Rhodes. Books him a holiday on this play island, you know, this nightclub place that everybody goes to just, just to dance and drink and women. That's all it is. She didn't know. She books him and a friend, a close friend of his, right? 
Now, they're going, they go to the airport, they get to the airport in Rhodes, and they're going in the coach, and they start hearing all this boom, 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 and he's thinking, what's going on here? And then suddenly, at that stop, they say, they give his name, and his friend's name, this is your destination. Now, he's hating it, because all there is down there is the drink and dancing all night, and, and then he discovers a bad secret. He discovers that his friend, this is the perfect place for him. He loves to drink. This was his best friend. This is a side that he did not know about his friend. Right? And this guy loves to drink and womanize and everything. He's enjoying himself and this guy is trying to stop him. And the guy is pleading with him. His friend is pleading, just let me go, let me go. This is my time. And this person is in hell, essentially. He says, sometimes I've had to bring him back drunk in a headlock, essentially, like this. Now, imagine it, on this island, you find yourself, if you did anything wrong with everything that's freely available for you, right, who's going to find out? Your mom is never going to find out, nobody ever is going to find out, except you and your friend is going to know, and he's already doing it, so why should he tell anybody? But no, he kept straight. This was to He goes, I did not feel an inclination to do anything. When we got back, he got, I broke up with that friend. The friend, you know, he was not a friend anymore, essentially. I lost a friend in that. I came back the next day. The results came out the next day. And I got an acceptance. After all of that, my mom comes up to me with a letter. Or oh, his dad, I can't remember exactly. He was accepted in King's College to do medicine. And today he's carried on. He's a bone surgeon. And he deals with... Uh, Except F, uh, uh, Formula One, he deals with a lot of these sports, uh, sports personalities. Now he's saying, I came from no good GCSE, no good A-level marks, to 29 rejections, to then an acceptance. And then he's a surgeon, and mashallah, he's such a wonderful man. Right? Now, how do you fit Qadr into all of this? He kept trying, number one. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see is your righteousness. Righteousness, the benefit that comes from righteousness is amazing. The benefit that comes from righteousness, it will provide you benefit from where you would never think. i give you another really weird example. There's a madrasa student. He's studying in another country, in India. He's studying in India, right? He finds out that in the village where he lives, he finds out from a close, really close cousin of his that there's a loose girl in town who, who's committed zina, right? Now, this is one of the bad things about, you know, recently there was uh, this WhatsApp message posted that went around saying 45% uh, percent of girls in U.S. universities have committed zina and drunk and this, that and the other. Most of you must have seen that. I think that's such a disservice. It is so disingenuous and I think it's very harmful. Zina is something that needs to be kept concealed. And the reason is very simple. The, uh, the, one, of, one of the causes, they say, for the sexual revolution and openness of uh, sexual appetite and vices and everything else that started in 1960s and 70s is because they, a lot of people say it's due to the Kinsey Report. This is in Indiana, there's this uh, organization, there was a Dr. Kinsey who started coming up with all of these statistics saying this many people have fantasized about the worst of things, animals and uh, young boys and young girls and this, that and the other. Now when you listen to this, when you hear this, and you've had similar found, uh, fantasies or bad ideas, sometimes shaitan has put them into your mind. and Because the mind is open to these things, shaitan can put any thought in your mind, right? Well, our job is to just repel them and to gain piety so that they come out. Uh, however, when you read that, oh, other people, you know, sometimes when you feel it's a taboo, I think like this, I must be such a bad person. To think like this. But when you see 50% of people think like this, 80% of people think like this, what are you going to think? Hey, that's normal. Do you understand? So I think it's very disingenuous to put this out. It doesn't help people. To think that that thing is going to make people stop committing zina is not going to do that. It's going to actually make people think, oh, there's so many other people doing it, it can't be that bad. Do you understand? They'll find more people that way. Anyway, this madrasa student who's studying the deen, but Shahwa desired, is a young man, you know, Shahwa has overcome this person. So this friend of his says, I can get her for you. I'm being very open. He says he can, you know, he says he can get her for you. So the guy says, yes, next time, it's too late now, the next time I come back in a holiday, then have her ready, right? So uh, the next time, the next time or the time after, I can't remember the exact details, but when he comes back the next time, he is fully ready for it. He's been waiting for this. He's never committed zina, never been 
right? But now he's really ready for this. And you know what happens? For some reason, that girl had to be somewhere else at that time. Right? Despite all the planning, she had to be somewhere else. So his, his holiday is miserable. But then he says, this is a story he relates afterwards, obviously. He says that after that, several years passed by, then he gets married. And he says, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, that that never occurred on that day. Because today when I get married, I am, mashallah, a chaste individual who has never committed zina beforehand. That would have been the stumbling block. And once that would have been done, it would have been done so many times. But Allah preserved him. He was ready for it. The thing I'm trying to tell you here, he was ready for it. He'd made up his mind. It was all planned. He was looking forward to it. But Allah protected him by making that other factor absent. Why? Because of the deen that he was studying. That saved him. He didn't know that. The Quran in his heart, he's a hafiz of the Quran, right? That Quran in his heart saved him. That's what I say that if you do good for people, then Allah will provide the benefit of that from the factors that are not in your control. Those benefits will come into your children as well. And there are so many people who are absolute jahil and ignorant individuals who can't even read Quran properly. But today they are sitting as the son of muftis and Shaykh al-Hadith because of the goodness of their heart and their respect for knowledge and the respect that they had for other people. Because we have free will. We have this window of free will, right? But there are two things which govern our free will. One is internal factors. And one other second is the external factors. What do I mean by that? I've got free will to do what I want. However, I could wake up that morning after deciding to go wherever, wherever I want. For example, if I wanted to go and see the fireworks, but then suddenly I get up and I feel, I feel uh, I've got a bloated stomach, right? I'm having to run or I've got diarrhea, for example, or somebody's sick with flu. He can't go anymore. A full decision to go. But internal factors have stopped you, right? Another one is, like the case of that person about zina, his full decision, free will decision, but the external factors didn't work out. So external factors are in the hands of Allah. Internal feelings, what makes you sick? Why do you feel tired some days, all of a sudden? Some days you feel fresh, some days you feel close, some days you feel far. All of that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, we have free will, but we have not absolute power. Absolute power is in the hands of Allah. We have free will, but not absolute power. That's why do as many good deeds as possible, and you will see the benefits of that come from ajib places where you won't even realize. And you try to do the best. Now, just read a few more hadith to you that tell us, that Quranic verse I mentioned about um, whatever musibah comes in the world or in your person, it's in, it's in a book that's written from before we even created you. That's what Allah says. That is very simple for Allah. Now He mentions why. This is so that you do not, you do not become sorrowful over what misses you. Once you've missed it, then khalas, it's, that was what Allah wanted. So you can fall back onto the fact that Allah loves us and He didn't want us to have that. That's why we don't have it. But before we, before we lose it, we have to try for it because we don't know whether we're going to lose it or not. It's only after you lose it that you must feel this way. Number two, bima <laughs> atakum. And if He does give you something, then don't start attributing it to yourself. Don't start exulting, don't start boasting, thinking, I achieved this, this was me, I am better than everybody in the world, I am the superior being. No, do not exult. Do not exult with what Allah gives you. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like all of those who are arrogant and who are conceited. That is the purpose of destiny. If you lose something, well, that's what Allah had in store for us. He'll give us something better. That's the way a believer thinks. Now, let me give you uh, an example of if you are about to do something wrong, there's a lot of people who say, well, that's what Allah has destined for me, right? Somebody commits haram, oh, because Allah destined for me to do it, I'm going to do it. That's part of my destiny. How can you say that? There's a, another beautiful hadith that is related 
uh, by Imam Bukhari and Muslim from Abu Huraira radiallahu an. It's a debate or a discussion rather, kind of a very interesting discussion between Musa alayhi salam and his great great grandfather Adam alayhi salam. It shows you the great softness of Adam alayhi salam and it shows you the boldness of Musa alayhi salam. Now look what happens. The Prophet sallallahu said, Hajja Adamu Musa. Adam alayhi salam had a discussion or a debate with Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam said, Anta alladhi akhrajta al-nasa min al-janna bi dhambik wa ashqaytahum. It is you who caused people to come out of Jannat and you made them unfortunate. What a bold statement to make to Adam alayhi salam. You caused everybody to come out of Jannah because of the error that you made, right? He obviously didn't say, say it in that kind of a, a sarcastic way, obviously. But it's a very bold statement in that sense. And you made them all unfortunate because they're not in Jannat. Now look at the way this compassionate father, our great-grandfather, responds. فَقَالَ Adam li Musa, أَنْتَ الَّذِي اسْتَفَاكَ اللَّهُ بِرِسَالَتِهِ وَبِكَلَامِهِ you're the one who Allah specially selected for his messengership and to speak to you specifically. وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا أَتَلُومُونِي عَلَىٰ أَمْرٍ كَتَبَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَيَّ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَخْلُقَنِي Are you censoring me and taunting me, censoring me for something that Allah wrote that I was going to do before I was even created? Now the question here is, isn't Adam alayhi salam using taqdeer as an excuse? Adam alayhi salam is using taqdeer as an excuse. He says, are you blaming me for something that Allah wrote for me to do before I was even created? In fact, in another version of this hadith, it says, أَتَلُومُونِ عَلَىٰ أَمْرٍ قَدَّرَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَيَّ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَخْلُقَنِي بِأَرْبَعِينَ عَامًا Are you blaming me for something that Allah wrote for me to do, predestined for me to do 40 years before He created me? Are you blaming me for that? Now, let's look at the judgment of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, فَحَجَّ آدَمُ مُوسَى Adam Alayhi Salaam beat Musa Alayhi Salaam in that debate. Meaning he overcame his argument. Why? He's using Qadr. You're not allowed to use Qadr to justify a wrongdoing. Alright? It's simple. You can do it after the fact. You can use Qadr to feel better after the fact. You can't use it before the fact. You've got an opportunity to sin. You can't say, well, that's my destiny. I'm going to do it. As somebody came to Umar, and he wanted to drink. He said, this is because of destiny. Umar then says, well, I'll hit you and, uh, and, and, and punish you also according to the destiny of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Because it's destiny once you've done it. Right? Now, you cannot use it. Oh, this is my destiny. That's why I'm going to do this haram. That's the way I am. No. If you've done something in the past, done and dusted, that's my destiny. Now, future is a different destiny. That's what this hadith teaches us. Very important. Okay, now let's look at a few hadith about this. There's a hadith recorded by Imam Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَن صَرَّهُ أَن يُبْسَطَ لَهُ فِي رِزْقِهِ وَيُنْسَأُ لَهُ فِي أَثَرِهِ فَلْيَصِلْ رَحِيمَهُ Anybody who it pleases that they be given expansion in their sustenance, expansion in their wealth, their sustenance, their rosy rizq, and they be given more... Uh, 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 length in their stay in the world that could mean longer life for example right then what do, does he do if he wants baraka in those things he should be good with his kinship go and do some kala kala don't feel bad about going to visit your relatives be good with your relatives your blood relatives tie the knots of kinship you'll get baraka you'll get increase expansion in your risk and in your lifespan. Now, of course, there's two meanings here. It could be that you get a few extra years or you get this many more pounds or food or whatever. Or it could mean that the amount that you do get, you get more barakah in it. So it's either quantitative or qualitative. At the same time, it is talking about a change though. So if it's written, you're going to get this much, then why is it that you can change it? Right? Number two. There's another hadith related by Imam Tabarani, which uh, it's mentioned in the Targhib. أن الصدقة المسلم تزيد في العمر وتدفع ميتة السوء ويذهب الله ويذهب الله به بها الكبر والفخر صدقة voluntary charity any kind of charity of a Muslim it increases your life it increases your life it removes a bad death 
it repels a bad death. You give sadaqa, it will repel a bad death. And Allah will remove your arrogance and conceit by it. Again, it's talking about change by action. How does that relate to Qadr? Number three, another hadith related by Tabarani and Hakim again. Inna al-bala'a wa dua Calamity and dua. So calamity is being sent to you, right? It's about to afflict you. Accident, shortfall, lose your job, whatever it is. And dua that you've just done. Bayna al-sama'i wal-ardi yaqtatilan they become locked into battle between the heaven and the earth. They become locked into battle between the heaven and earth. Imagine calamity coming down, dua going up, and it stops it there, it keeps it fighting there. Until, Your dua will prevent this calamity from coming down upon you. So again, what's going on here? What is written? If it's written, how is this being changed? Is a simple answer to all of this. It's not as complicated as you think. Okay? Now, let's understand that this divine tablet we spoke about, in which everything is written, there are two types of things written in there. Things are written in two types. There are two types of taqdeer. One is called taqdeer mubram, and another one is called taqdeer mu'allak. Don't worry about the Arabic words. One is called a firm destiny, and the other one is the contingent, dependent destiny. That's all you have to remember. The firm one will never change. The day you are going to be born is not going to change for you. There's a number of other factors that are not going to change. Right? The taqdeer mu'allak are those things which go with those hadith. If a person makes dua, it says it in there. It's like, you know, in your, and this is a very bad example, but just to conceptualize. You know, when you're playing a game, and it has many levels and it's a complicated game where if you go this way and you complete this then it opens up this side for you and if you go this way then it opens this door for you and there's a whole different world there do you understand so in the in the divine tablet the two options are written there is he going to be good with his relatives or not that's what the angels see and it said that if he is good then give him this much expansion if he's bad then give him don't give him expansion that's what they can see. Now the person with his free will is good. So the rest of this is opened up. He's good. Expansion. Okay, let's close this door. Let's carry on with this way. This is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. Yamhullahu ma yasha'u wa yuthbit. Allah erases what he wants and keeps firm what he wants. This is exactly here. But wa'indahu ummul kitab. But he has the mother of all the books which is the knowledge of Allah. In there, nothing changes. He knows whether you are going to be good or bad, and he knew the track you were going to take anyway. But what's written in the divine tablet is in this form. So according to the angels and you and the creatures, there's that possibility of increase or decrease. Do you understand? Just for us to be able to interact with that. But Allah knows what we're going to do. That's why you make dua. How does dua affect it? I'll give you an example. There is another hadith which is uh, related by Bukhari again. The Sahaba asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulallah. Now listen to this carefully. He said, Ya Rasulallah, Araita adwiyatan natadawi biha, wa ruqan nastarqi biha, wa tuqan nattaqi biha, hal taruddu min qadrillahi shay'an. Now all the possible things you could use to change something, right? They, they asked, Ya Rasulallah, you know these medicines that we take and we use to cure ourselves with, or the ruqya that we do, that we use to cure ourselves with, or the abstinence. You know when the doctor tells you, don't eat this, don't eat that. It's supposed to help you. You know, that's too cold for you, that's too hot for you, for example. What about the abstinence that we use? Does that change Qadr in any way? Look at the answer. What do you think the answer is? فَقَالَ هِيَ مِنْ قَدْرِ اللَّهِ They are all part of the Qadr of Allah. That Allah knows you're going to use this, so that's how it's... He knows what you're going to do. That's how it's all factored in. But for us, we don't know. For us, we take it as it comes. That's why don't ever think you know what's going to happen after 10 years. Because you don't. You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Right? You don't even know what you're going to earn tomorrow. So how can you think you are doomed and you're going to die going to hell? How do you know that? There's enough, t enough place in the good ship. Jump ship, come on brothers. There's enough space here. It's empty. There's lots of space. 
right? So that's why people st should stop feeling depressed as bad as their life has been, as sinful as they have been, because it's all part of the qadr of Allah. That's why Allama uh, Lucy says that, you know, among all of these factors, dawa, uh, abstinence, ruqya, the most powerful is dua. But it's still another factor. Just as these things could be used by Allah to so-called give you an excuse to do something. For example, you know when you make a vow, if this happens, I'll, I'll give this much money to the masjid. If I come first in my exam, or if I get this job, then I'll pay 1,000 uh, donations to the masjid. Right? Now, does that really change the taqdeer for you? Because you're going to give a 1,000, Allah says, yeah, yeah, please, you know, I need that 1,000. No, the Prophet ﷺ said, nothing happens. According to Allah, nothing happens for you. It's just a way to remove wealth from a bakhil person. Right? Because you're only going to give as much as you think is valuable to you. So it's just giving wealth. I mean, nothing is going to change. But if that makes you feel good, alhamdulillah. So when you look at it from the human being, then all of these factors come into play. But from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows it all. And that's why the best way to explain the relationship between us and Allah is that we have to just focus on us. We feel free will. We feel it. We experience it. We know it. And there's two verses which I forgot to mention that prove it. Allah, which I read right in the beginning. Allah says, وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ Say that truth is from your Lord. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Whoever wants, they can believe. Whoever wants, they can disbelieve. Allah is giving choice. That's the choice that people have been taking in the world. Another verse in Surah Al-Insan. The first one is from Surah Al-Kahf. This one is Surah Al-Insan. إِنَّ هَذِهِ تَذْكِرَةً this is a reminder. فَمَنْ شَاءَ اتَّخَذَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِ سَبِيلًا Whoever wants, they can find a path to Allah. Whoever doesn't want, they don't have to find a path. So it's the choice is ours. اِحْرِسْ عَلَىٰ مَا يَنْفَعُكَ Just try to do the best for yourself. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُلِ اعْمَلُوا فَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ You, uh, uh, the, the, say, say, O Prophet, you do your deeds, make your efforts, try hard, Allah's going to watch you. Allah is going to watch you. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُطْلِعَكُمْ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ Nobody knows the unseen. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُطْلِعَكُمْ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ Surah Ali Imran, Allah says, Allah doesn't have to make anybody privy to the unseen. Allah is not going to reveal the unseen to anybody. That's His knowledge. That's His knowledge. Now, we must avoid bad things possibly coming to us and a bad ending because Allah does say in Surah Sa'd وَلَا تَتَّبِعِ الْهَوَىٰ فَيُضِلَّكَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Don't keep following your lowly desires and your caprice so that it will misguide you, deviate you from, uh, fr from the path of Allah. So you might think that you're doing all good but you keep doing these little wrongs, they will eventually affect you, they could affect you. Because Allah may hate something of that you do like that and just wash away everything. So we need to try to be فَلَمَّا زَاغُوا أَزَاغَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ Surah Al-Saf وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمُ الْفَاسِقِينَ It's when they, de uh, when they cause some crookedness that Allah uh, uh, made their hearts crooked. It comes from us first before Allah will كَلَّا رَانَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ Their hearts have become rusted totally. Because of some deed that did. It's because of what you did. So remember that. If you keep doing good, Allah will provide the barakah in these other factors that will come to you. And that's why I give you another one example. Right? Another one, another one example. How Allah works in so mysterious ways. Right? Um, I went to, when I went to India last time, uh, I visited the doctor beforehand and he gave me three different tablets. One of those tablets, he said, I'm giving you a double size uh, because I want you to take 500 grams or something. So if I give you the double ones, I'm not going to give you 750. I'll give you the f uh, 1000 ones so you can break it in half so you can you know, only have half. Now, I was in a big rush beforehand, so I got the medicine and then I had the two diabetes medicines. I went to India and one of the diabetes medicines, which you're only supposed to take 50 or 500 grams, I can't remember anymore, right? Um, I ran out of. So I went into a chemist and I said, I want this particular medicine. He gave me the medicine and little did I know that these are double the size. Because, you know, I didn't know, right? So 
I may have taken it one day, but the next day I suddenly it occurred to me that the doctor had told me only take half of this. I thought half of this, but I was confused. But I thought to be safe, okay, I'll just break them in half and half half. I come back home after a few weeks and I check and I, you know, Ajib, I was totally wrong, but I was right. It's really weird. But I was wrong, but I was right. The reason why I was wrong is it was not this medicine he told me to take half of. He'd given me the right amounts. I'd run out of them. The ones I bought were double the size. I was caused to think that these were the ones he had spoken about. Thus, I started taking the right amount, which was half the price. Do you understand? Because when I came on, I saw the other one, which I didn't have to take then, right? That that was the one he told me to take half of. But you see how Allah works now? I wish he did this for me all the time in all good things. Right? This was just a random, to me random, but to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calculated example. This is the way Allah works, behind a veil. For me, I was thinking, man, what's wrong with my mind? But that what's wrong with my mind was a good factor. Because it saved me from taking double up, because though, uh, it's a, uh, what do you call those? Um, it lowers your blood sugar. So you could actually become hypoglycemic. And, you know, faint if you take too much of those tablets because it just drops your blood sugar, right? Ajeeb how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. And I'm sure everybody has factors of unexplainable things. You don't know how many calamities you have and I have been saved from just because you do regularly, you do dua. You may be doing dua for success in your exams. You may be doing dua to get married to such and such a person or to get this, that and the other. That thing hasn't come to you. You still haven't got that thing, right? But every dua that you made has stopped a calamity from coming to you. Now, if you say, I don't know that because I haven't seen the record of all of these things, then just don't make dua for a while and see what happens. Right? I don't think you want to risk that. But believe me, every dua that we make, every good deed that we do, there's a benefit from it. There's a benefit from it. And the only time wrong will happen to us in our mind is when Allah wants it to happen. Now, uh, when, I, uh, when I got a bit, uh, when I did pause a bit about talking about death, the reason is that according to Allah, our death is written. According to Allah and his ilm al-kitab. But because I was speaking about the divine tablet, the divine tablet will, could have two options in there. That if he's good with his kin, give him another five years. Or it could also mean give him more barakah in the 60 years that he already has. But if you remember the story when Adam salam was shown all of his progeny and he liked the look of Dawood salam, right? When he was shown in, uh, in, after he was created, he was shown all of his progeny and there was a person with a spark he says, who's that? He says, oh, that's Dawood He says, give him 40 years of my life. So when 40 years were left of Adam Salam's life, Adam Salam kept thinking he had his full life. He forgot afterwards, right? And the angel of death comes to him and says, time to go. He says, why? I've got 40 years left. You and I can't say that. But he knew angel, uh, the prophets are told and other people are told when they're going to die sometimes, right? So he said, but you gave that to Dawood Salam. He says, Nasiya Adam, Adam alayhi salam for, forgot, so his ummah forgets as well. Alright? But anyway, here, that's an interesting story. The main thing is that keep doing, do not become depressed. All those people who are listening to this, sitting at home, wherever, and you are depressed about something, and you think nothing is going right, your job, your responsibility is not to think the worst. You could have had 10, 15, 20, 30 years of the most evil. Believe me, I've seen a guy, I've seen a guy, what, what happened is we were going from Stockton, uh, we, we, were, we were going from Sacramento in California to, uh, I believe, Stockton or Lodi or somewhere like that. And a friend of ours, right, who was going through some bad time, uh, he'd gone through a bad divorce and he had older children and his wife was just causing massive problems because through the children, one of those really bad scenes that happened. And he was always kind of depressed, right? But he always stuck with good people. He did his tahajjud prayer and everything like that. And I used to feel so sorry for him. I used to feel really sorry for him. What happens is, we're going and we all got into the cars. He got into the wrong car and ended up in another city, <coughs> right? And after that, later on, he's brought back here. And then he says to us, he says, that's the story of my life. What happened today is the story of my life. I try to go somewhere, I end up somewhere else, right? 
That's how he felt at that time. Alhamdulillah today, after so many proposals and things, he's found a good woman to marry. And subhanAllah, his two children who are being corrupted by their mother have both turned to Islam properly, even though in his absence. And his tahajjud prayer has, prayed, has, has definitely paid off. Because I know he used to cry and pray. He's a wealthy man, but I know he used to do this. Today, after 10 years, you know, I've known him for about 10 years, but after 10 years, I can say he's a happy man today. He's a happy man today. Allah has shown him happiness because he did not give up. He did not give up. That was the story of his life then. Today, he's a different person. Remember, you can be a different person. You can be a different person. Never give up. Allah has so much ability and nothing is beyond his control. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Uh, the point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially for example the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules and at the end of that inshallah you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind, you can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.